Welcome everyone. So it's our next uh, colloquium. So today you have Henning Feldman. He actually enjoyed a very interesting transition from cold atoms because he was working first with Maciek Levenstein, Levenstein at Hanover. He was awarded PhD in 2006. And then he changed the subject. And his new subject is connected to astronomical observations. He's involved in the project related to gravitational wave astronomy. And today, the topic of this uh, today's colloquium will be related uh, to astronomy. So, Henning, I think that's it. And now the screen and floor is yours. I will give you to inform you five minutes. Just the end. Thank you very much. Right. So, it's a real pleasure for me to be here after so many years. And um, thank you for, for coming. Um, today, I'd like to talk about data analysis in gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, I will give a very uh, small sketch about uh, the theory of gravitational waves that have come from, but this is textbook knowledge, so um, it's easy to, to pick that up to learn that. I also mentioned the experiments, uh, but then I want to go deeper into the data analysis. Um, so we have uh, different branches. Now in Hanover. So uh, the, the search for compact binary coalescence signals is well established nowadays. So there are many known signals. Um, heading for continuous waves is still open. So it hasn't been discovered yet. So that's that's challenging and interesting. And we also find a new found a new group um, which is looking to the Pulsar timing arrays. So finding gravitational waves using pulsars in a Pulsar timing array. Uh, I briefly mentioned parabolic estimation, and then I want to introduce our computational facility in, in Hanover Atlas. Oh, that's the one. So I start at unit one, just Newton basically. So he discovered that um, very geniusly that actually an apple falling down is behaving the same law, as following the same laws as the moon circling around the Earth. So that was pretty good already at that time. It was good for many hundred years until they started to look more carefully in the, in, into the subject. Um, so um, there have been some problems with the Mercury orbit, so which have me addressed at that time. So Einstein was actually um, picking that topic up and solved that problem, solved the problem um, by describing um, our our universe, um, the space time. Which is following some dynamics. So the curvature of that space time is, is um, um, described by, by the Einstein field equation. And the curvature basically is uh, denoted by that metric G, which is um, the flat metric and, and some perturbation in higher order. So it just was linearizing that field and putting that into the Einstein field equation. Um, and Linearizing the field equation got a weight equation for, for our distortion. So, and that is just a normal weight equation. So, you can express the solution by waves um, with the wavelengths and, and the frequency. So, and this is already with the, with the theory. Um, the solution um, looks like, or you can express the, so the solution by, by a matrix and you very quickly figure out that you have two modes. So that is the uh, full solution of the of the distortion, of the perturbation of the distortion. And you have two modes, two solutions, a so-called X mode and Y mode. And what it means is um, if a wave passes through a point, um, the the running time of a of a light spark is changing over time. So it's shorter and longer and shorter and longer. So that is the gravitational waves. So either the, you can say the, the length has changed, but essentially what you measure is, uh, is the, the light traveling time there. So and this, that oscillates. Um, so that is very um, interesting because um, the, the matter, the mass sitting on some point in the space time does not experience any acceleration. Still, we have this longer light traveling time. So it looks like acceleration, but it's not actually an acceleration. Um, how can we measure that? So different experiments have been suggested, and um, one of the most promising candidates, which led to the discovery of gravitational waves, is a Michelson interferometer. So um, what you do is you create a, 
uh, laser beam and you split it with a beam splitter to the uh, top and to the right, uh, it goes into the Fabi Perot interferometer chamber to um, so long base the arm length of that um, interferometer. It's reflected at the end and it comes back. So if and uh, comes back to the beam splitter and it goes into a detector and we have interference patterns there, we have an interference. So what happens if you have a changing uh, runtime for the light, uh, the interfer interference pattern on the detector changes over time. And this is the signal. Um, the distortion of the space is very small. So it's, it's very, very small. So Einstein was doing some computations in the beginning. So he was rotating a meter long stick and he realized, oh, this is so small, it can't be discovered. He was going to bigger objects, planets, stars, and even the stars, he realized that this is very hard to measure. So he dropped that topic and said, okay, it can't be measured, not interesting. Um, so it took 100 years to, to figure out how that can be measured. Um, there have been indications in the 70s already that, um, that gravitational waves exist by looking the, to the energy uh, emission of a binary uh, system, different star system, and they realized that uh, the frequency changes uh, and can only be explained the change by adding to the normal emission energy emission by EM uh, the gravitational waves. So once you take that into account, uh, the energy emission could be explained very well. It gave some rise into the question whether we can detect it in another way as well. So and they started to develop the Meissner algorithm technique. Um, so there are several um, plans and existing experiments already. So we are here in that region. So these are uh, earthbound interferometer. Um, the first one had been in the States and Livingston and Hanford. Um, another one was going online two years ago in, in Italy, Virgo. Uh, Kagran in uh, Japan is running now. Indigo is developing one. There's a small one in Hanover as well. Um, and what you can see here is um, the, the typical frequency, so the sensitive frequency. So these black lines are the sensitivity curves. So the sensitivity curve is uh, given here. And here you can see the, the distortion. So the relative distortion is 10 to minus 19 for the object you want to you want to see, or 10 to minus 22. So this is very small. Um, so um, and the detectors are sensitive in certain frequencies for particular distortions. So um you have here the earthbound detectors. They also plan the Einstein telescope, which has already a shift in the frequency. It goes to as lower arms, it goes to lower frequencies. Um, and there are also plans for, for airborne um, gravitation wave detectors in space, and they have very long arms, it's like millions, millions or millions of kilometers, which means you go really to lower frequencies. So um, it correlates with arm lengths. Okay, um, and if you go to very low frequencies, um, you enter the region of the pulsar timing array, which is a different technique, basically. They will use pulsars to, or pulsars should be, will be used to, to extract the gravitation wave signals from the pulsar signals. So, um, so that part here is usually an optical table in the middle with the, the laser and detector. And uh, that is basically a picture of, of such a table. So the table had been built in Hanover and they sent to the buildings in Hanford for the, for the first detectors. So they are constantly new things like uh, speed slide um, producers to, to, uh, to reduce noise, the noise, short noise, to increase the sensitivity. Okay, so that uh, was a sketch of the experiment. So let's go a little bit into the signals. So um, we had a group in Hanover working on bursts. So bursts are basically just uh, outbreaks of gravitation waves. Um, and what you do is you look to different uh, detectors and then you just correlate them. So if it appears on one detector and another detector within a certain time range, um, 
you consider this to be as a potential signal that's outside of this uh, window, um, then it's apparently just just uh, uh, stochastic noise. Um, so we uh, work very much uh, to detect compact binary coalescence signals, CBC signals. So these are basically heavy objects which are spiraling, which are in the, the end phase of the of the merger process. So what we see is the, the last part of the of the circulation, then the merge, and then the ring down. Um, continuous waves um, are also considered now. So there's extensive work to define continuous waves, and we're also looking into the stochastic background using the PPA for the timing array. Okay, so how does the signal look like? So we have basically two masses, two uh, massive objects uh, with a mass M1 and M2. And the signal you see on your detector is basically this oscillation here. So over the time it oscillates, and then as they uh, come closer, the amplitude increases, the frequency goes down, then there's a merger, which is a uh, spike in the amplitude, and then there's a ring down, which is basically uh, when it comes down in a very short time range. So what we have to do is basically we have to record the data and then we have to look into the data and uh, and uh, try to figure out whether there's a signal or not. Usually what you see is a lot of noise. Um, what we're doing is we're computing the scalar product of a uh, potential signal with the data set as this is data set and H is a uh, potential uh, signal. So we call that a template. So there are very many different templates. Uh, we, no, uh, we weigh that with a sensitivity function S. So in some frequencies, uh, the detector is more sensitive than in others. So we try to Builds everything out, which is unimportant, and uh, the most sensitive parts get more weight. The problem here is that, first of all, we don't know uh, which signal we are looking for, and second, where exactly starts the signal. So this is here in the Fourier space, and this is in the real-time space. So if this is our template here, uh, starts at a certain point, here's the merger part, and then there's a ring down, but uh, probably that signal hasn't been uh, uh, started here, but it could have been started like here or here or here, so we don't know where it starts. So, which means in principle, we should uh, do our our scalar, computer, our scalar product, do our matching at each time step, which is very cumbersome. So, we have all the templates and we have all the time slices, and uh, can take tons of work to actually find the signal. So, um, but that's a simple trick, actually. I mean, since we are doing the scalar product in the police space. We can add a time shift there easily. So we just uh, do the time shift by this uh, exponential, um, by this rotation here, phase rotation, uh, which depends on T0. And suddenly our, um, our scalar product depends on T0. So, and this is basically the Fourier transform. So Fourier transform doesn't go with n squared, it goes with n log n. We save a lot of time by, by doing that. So this is the normal way to do nowadays mesh filtering in the, in the previous space. Um, so what remains is still the, the many different templates. So that is um, draw of a sketch of the of the sensitivity curvature. So you have here a very sensitive range uh, between 100 and hertz and, and one kilohertz. Uh, it becomes insensitive for lower frequencies and for higher frequencies. There are different kinds of noises there. So in the Fourier space, a signal might look like this. So just a free transform of a typical signal without units. So if if you have a template which looks completely different, you see that the scalar product will be zero. So if you multiply it and sum it up, there will be basically no contribution. It is just noise. You won't see that with the, the wrong template. Um, but instead, if you have a, a template which is close to the signal, so not too far away. You will have a signal, which is not one if you normalize that, but it's close to one. So, and uh, this is what happens. If you vary the mass one, we'll see that the match increases, and at a certain point, it reaches your critical limit, which is usually 98 or 97 percent or 0 0.97. 
Uh, and then there's a small range here uh, where you can detect the signal. The rest disappears in the noise. Um, so which means our template actually sits here and you can detect any signal which is in a certain mass regime. So there's a lower mass and a higher mass and in between these masses we can find our signal. So that template is good for finding a signal in a certain mass range, which is very important because if you you can't basically do the mesh for all possible signals, it's impossible as a continuous space. So you have to discretize the space by setting, by finding certain templates. And uh, this is actually a challenging task. So um, the question is how do we place templates? So what is the way to find out which templates have been placed where in order to cover the parameter space in a, in a sufficient way to not losing any signals, potential signals. Um, and excuse me, uh, how large is the effective parameter space? Because apart from the signal, we also have to take into account position on the sky. Yeah. So pos position of the sky is actually not that challenging, at least for CDC. For CW it is, but not for CDC, because you have uh, the signal on two detectors, several detectors nowadays, or four detectors, and by the runtime in between, you can actually uh, figure out from which direction the signal came. So position is not is there, not a problem. There's no redshift yet, or no, no Doppler effect yet. Redshift, is, but there's no Doppler effect yet because they are, the signals last for very few seconds. Yes, but you also have polarization. So how many parameters do you have altogether in this case? Uh, I, I can do that. Um, so the so usually you consider the x and plus uh, polarization to be the same. Um, which is not true if you have certain signals, like if you have uh, precision. Um, so you have the two masses, M1 and the 2 but usually you consider the mass ratio of the two masses, but the total mass is also important. So these are two parameters. Uh, then there's a spin of the two objects, uh, which are um, which are three, six parameters already, but you, I think you can, yeah, six parameters. Um, Usually, what they do is they just consider a line spins, which so just so hooks down to one parameter. So it's essentially a two-dimensional space on this case to cover. Um, okay, so let's say this is the signal. And the signal um, can be detected in the parameter space. So this is just a two-dimensional drawing or sketch. So let's say this is mass one and mass two, and that signal can be detected by any template which is in that region. So. So, for instance, if there's a particular template, that signal will be detected. If there's a no template in the region, we won't see that signal. Um, but that template also covers a certain space. So, the, what we know is if we find a certain uh, a correlation, we find a match that inside the red circle is our signal. We found a signal with inside that parameter regime. So, and the question is, how do we set actually these, these templates in the parameter space? So, um, well, you can start with basically setting a lattice, an optimal lattice. But the optimal lattice, the best covering lattice in different dimensions varies. So, in low dimensions, it's uh, usually an A and star lattice, so which is in 2D, it's a triangular lattice. Um, but this is good for certain dimensions. If you go to higher dimensions, very often the, the lattice are just unknown. You don't know what the optimal lattice is. Um, but there's intensive studies. It goes into math, and that is math. So there's intensive studies to find the optimal lattice. Um, so if you don't know what the optimal lattice is in higher dimensions, you could just do random template placing. Um, the problem with random template placing is that you will have gaps in your parameter space. So and you have to at least say my gaps are so big, so um, there's a certain chance to, to miss matches. Uh, which you can specify via random placements. Um, there's another technique which is called stochastic placement. So what it does is um, we start with a single template in the parameter space and we set another template and we ignore any template uh, which uh, is already being covered by a radius of another template. So each template has a minimum distance, a minimum covering distance from each other. We only accept new templates if they have a distance to all the other already placed templates, um, which can be quite cumbersome. So if you have hundreds of thousands of templates and you want to place a new one, you have to test the new template, the candidate, against any other template. And only if, 
the space is not yet covered by all the other templates you set in the template. So, um, but you can show that if you do it properly, you will cover the entire parameter space with a finite set of, of templates. That's the good thing. But doing the setting is very cumbersome. Um, so later we developed also an optimized placement. So what we do there is we just start with a Sohaki template thing, which is not very good in covering, but then we start to move the templates around such that the, the coverage space is increased. So, and um, the, the number of templates you need there is way smaller. And with, the, with shifting the templates, you can cover a big part of the parameter space or the biggest part, close to one. And recently, uh, we have been also thinking about an optimal lattice quantizer. So just maximize the, the, the um, covering is one criteria, but you can also try to minimize uh, the integrated uh, distance squared in the entire parameter space in the closed template. If you do that, this is a different kind of lattice, a different kind of placement, um, which is called optimal lattice quantizer. Um, we are doing that because you see in the covering, we can approximate here the, the mismatch. The mismatch is basically one minus the mesh. The mismatch goes with the square of, of moving away from the templates. Okay. So that is a stochastic template bank. That's an example for stochastic template bank. So all the templates have a minimum distance to each other. And you see that across the parameter space, uh, the magic changes. So it's not, not a homogeneous flat parameter space. So that is an example for optimized uh, parameter space. So let me see whether I can start the example, try the movie, how the optimization works. So in that case, I'm using a dominant method. So I just try to, um, I consider the distance between the templates as springs and I try to minimize the energy. And you see here the, the covering goes close to one and this is the second one there, which is being minimized. So these settings have been used actually, so we tried it in computational uh, way of research, the optimization, um, but um, they have already done a template bank and we try to optimize here and there. So they use different techniques to set the templates here. Uh, partially, uh, they, they use the Sohasi template bank, uh, partially uh, lattices. Um, and they want to cover the, the crucial space of, of the CBC signals. So going from uh, very a few solar masses up to 100 solar masses. Okay, um, so here are the first three detectors, uh, Hanford, Livingston, and, and Pisa, and they have a certain distance to each other. Yeah. Uh, so I have two, one question about the templates. <laughs> because you talked about how to place those uh, templates to optimize it. But can you optimize the templates itself? Like the, because the templates are those functions and calculate the color product. And I understand that in principle you would choose the function that corresponds to an event for some set matter. Yeah. But you could also change those functions so that it doesn't correspond to any one event, but maybe like this color product behaves kind of better. So you will never get one, but you your pattern is better. Is it like something that you consider or um, well a template? Um, or the, the mismatch is defined by the, by the, by the scala product of, of, of the data and, and the template. So, and, uh, so what it is in, in the reality is, it's not a, it's very often not a clean function actually. So it's not, a, so if you move in the parameter space, it's not a sphere around a certain point. It can, it has very often banana shape, yeah. uh, coverings. So uh, in that respect, uh, you are doing already the best. So you are doing mesh filtering, and uh, the, the mismatch is defined by that mesh filtering, by that scalar product. So and this is the uh, best you can do. I mean, uh, there are approximations. So you can say, okay, I do approximations and take just the, the, the square distance to compute my shape of the template. Then I have a, a lipsoid. That's simple. But this is usually not what is being done. So you really do the mismatch to, to set the templates. 
so which is very expensive. If you can do a proper approximation and you can show that the approximation is good, if you do a harmonic approximation, then you are very fast and way faster in testing the templates. So, but uh, it's often not that easy. So you have to do the real mesh. So it's the best function you can, can do that. Yeah. So um, if a signal comes in, there is a delay between the signal arriving in Lidixon and in Hanford. So, and this distance here is smaller than actually uh, the light traveling time between the two detectors, then it's a potential signal. If the distance is bigger, then apparently it's something else. We don't have to consider that. So we have to find for, we have to search for coincidence on the two detectors on the several detectors we have now uh, and look at the distances are actually inside these time windows. <clears throat> So, uh, and if you know the distances, you can say, okay, the signal must have come from a certain direction. So, if the distance is six milliseconds, uh, it defines a particular direction. Actually, it defines more than only one particular direction. It can also come from another direction, which also causes, so it can come here from the top left, but it also can come from the, from the lower left and go up. So, um, and in 3D, actually, it's a cone what you have. Mm -hmm. So, once you have a delay, you have a cone of thousands of directions where the signal is coming from. If you have two detectors, if you have more than two detectors, if you have three or four or five detectors, you are intersecting cones. Mm -hmm. And then you really can pinpoint this dilocation of the signal. Mm -hmm. So, this is what's being done. Uh, you can also play with the polarization, and it tells you uh, already if you only have two detectors where it comes from. So, you can string the uh, the, the the set of, of uh, possible directions that's coming from. But if you have more detections, you can really pinpoint the direction that's coming from by having the second cones. So, but the question is, what do we see? I mean, if you find something, uh, what is that? Is that noise? So that is actually a question you have to answer. I mean, if you have a mismatch, uh, you have to Think about uh, the possibility whether this is a false positive signal. So you have to get a rate of the false field positive signal. So you have to do some uh, exterior work. Um, and for that, you do a background estimation. So you assume you have no signal, you just have background, and then you find as many false positives as possible to get a statistics about the false positives. Um, and having a set of data, this easily can be done by just shifting a set of data. If you have, uh, if you have the recording of one year, uh, you can do the statistic for one year. But usually what you want to have is you want to have a recording of many thousand years. And the trick is basically by shifting the signal of one detector by a, a certain amount of time uh, compared to the other detector. So if you just shift it by 50 milliseconds, you are certainly out of the Bottom time frame of a coincidence of Hanford and Livingston. So you shift the data by 50 milliseconds, and then you do a coincidence search between the two detectors. You do it again with 30 millise uh, milliseconds, and so on. And you can do it uh, for the entire year. And in that way, you get thousands of years of detection, which is quite expensive, actually. Um, this is a standard technique. You're not only doing it here, so you can also do it for other random parameters. So for the CPC shift search, they did this 50 millisecond uh, slide shifting, and they generated 608,000 of years of uh, background analysis. Um, they also did it for the burst, but um, there they took 600 uh, second slides. And the result is the following. So uh, this presents the number of false positives. How likely is it to have a signal within one year? And as you can see here, so this is sensitivity. Um, if you if you just slightly uh, above the noise, you have of course more false positives. So this is what we see here. So um, if you have uh, so if you're if you're of the order of uh, ten or or more above the noise, the chance to have false positive is very small and it decreases. Um, uh, it decreases. I, here you see the, the the detection statistics. Here you see the the, the size of the signal above the noise, and um, this is the probability that you find such a signal. So the stronger the signal, 
So it's more unlikely is it to have it uh, to be a for to have it as a for for the team. If you see a signal, it's very likely a signal. It's not noise. Um, and the black curve here is um, the real data they took when they had the first discovery. And uh, for high statistics here, that's basically the result of, of, of that signal. If you remove that signal, then you get the blue curve, so which means uh, the higher the, the, the signal, the, the stronger the signal, the more unlikely, unlikely it is. The first discovery was was here, so it has a very uh, it was a very strong signal. It was uh, twenty three above the noise, and uh, the background statistics um, yield that the chance to find such a signal is very small. So if you want to bet whether it's a signal or not, where would you put your coin, your twenty dollars? So everybody was sure by then that this must be a signal. How are these things calculated in some kind of Bayesian approach with uh, these confidence levels? Um, uh, what yeah, what you do is basically you just uh, you do the batch filtering and then you look to the mesh. How big is the mesh? So and uh, which is basically the the likelihood. And if uh, you can. See, Look to the amplitude of the mesh. And if the mesh, um, so you just collect the highest meshes and you go, go higher and higher with your detection statistics. And, um, and you, then you just count how, how many of these, uh, high meshes we have. And this is the curvature we see here. So that is the, um, the current catalog of, of detections. So it's already quite a lot and, uh, it's becoming more and more. So there are some very interesting signals there. So we have here uh, this the the mass range here in, in solar masses, and everything below two solar masses is certainly neutron star. So we have a, a few mergers of uh, neutron star neutron stars, and this is particularly interesting. Um, but you also have uh, mergers of neutron stars with binary uh, with, with uh, black holes. But the majority is basically a merger of to black holes, into bigger black holes. Um, at least one of these uh, neutron star mergers, binary neutron star mergers, was emitting also light. So people have been able to observe that. So um, you could increase the uh, detection statistics by also looking to, to electromagnetic counterparts, which is um, state of the art now. So which is called multi messenger detection. Okay. Um, that was CBC. A lot of effort has been put into uh, the detection of continuous waves. Um, and continuous waves um, are emitted by neutron stars. So uh, if you have a spinning neutron star, um, the excentricity might be not zero. You might have uh, some uh, mountains on that neutron star. So which means if it rotates, you have an acceleration, acceleration mass. Mass accelerations by just by the rotation, uh, and having accelerated masses uh, leads to the gravitational wave emission, which is a continuous phase because it's constantly rotating all the time. The amplitudes of these gravitational waves are very small, so way smaller than the merger. So, which means you have to look more carefully and longer into the data sets. Um, the longer means it's not just a few seconds. You look, oh, you have to look for years to find these signals. Um, if uh, continuous waves uh, passing through our system, um, we have a Doppler shift. So mm -hmm. the Earth motion goes in one direction. We have a Doppler shift to the Earth rotation around the Sun, but also to the to the own spin of the Earth and a lot of other things. So. Um, you have a blue shift if it, go, if it goes uh, in, the, in the other direction towards the signal. There's no Doppler shift uh, if you just here in that region. And you have a um, red shift if you go with the, with the wave. Um, and the observation goes over years, so you have to take into account these shifts. The problem is, if the wave comes from the other side, you have a completely different Doppler shift. So by looking onto the Doppler shift, you can 
determine the position, the, the location of the signal, you can determine the direction of the signal. Um, if you have no shift at all, it would mean that the signal comes from uh, from, from the uh, direction perpendicular to the polar plane, or from the other side. Yeah? And about the influence of the movement of the sun over the galaxy, is there any? It also needs to be considered, yeah. 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 But it's a constant shift, and so, I mean, uh, uh, it doesn't change direction within a year so much. Mm -hmm. So I mainly have to consider the the Earth motion along the sun. So this is uh, giving a big contribution. Um, so if you do observation for a long time, let's do some numbers. So if the if the uh, Neutron star spins with like 800 hertz, which is already the upper limit, so you won't go above this yet. Uh, and you do an observation for uh, 86,400 seconds a day times uh, 65 uh, days a year times three years, if you observation run for three years. Um, you have five uh, times 10 to the 10 cycles in your recording of a potential gravitational or continuous gravitational wave. Which is a lot. So this also means if you're just off by one cycle, so if you if you if you choose the wrong frequency, then you won't see the signal anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through all this five uh, times ten to the ten uh, signals. But also if you have to uh, do the uh, demodulation of of your Doppler shift. If you do the demodulation wrong, just by a little bit, you won't see the signal anymore. So which means you have to look into very many different sky locations, looking to very many different frequencies. And also, the neutron stars have usually a spin down. So they, the, the frequency decreases because they emit energy. Hey. Uh, you have, which also means you have to. Hey. Uh, somebody's saying well, something. Someone from the online audience is speaking. But I don't know. Is there a question from an uh, online audience? Suddenly yours. Yes. Maybe it was an accident. So it, this means uh, you have to um, also consider the spin down. So these are some parameters, and um, if you sum them up, you end up with 10 to 19 templates, which is quite cumbersome. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot of computational resources. In particular, if you do the free transform over a very long time with very many samples, so you can't do it for everything the entire time. So what you usually do is you do a semi-coherent search, and uh, this is currently done by Hanover and uh, several PhD works are dedicated to that. So what they do is in the first stage they do they just consider smaller time frames, they just consider a few hours, um, and they do the pre transform. They get a lot of um, potential signals, a lot of candidates, uh, which are of course not very high, but they collect them all because they want to miss the real signal in the end. Um, and they take that uh, catalog of candidates and they do uh, in the next stage uh, longer Fourier transforms for, for a longer time range. And they kick out a lot of, they redo a lot of candidates and they do it in seven stages. And for the very final set of candidates, they do the entire Fourier transform over the entire time. Um, they also use other techniques to, to find the signal. So they say if you find something in a certain sky location, um, for a particular uh, spin down, uh, any match in the vicinity of that particular template uh, could be also correct. So they never occur alone. So there should be several matches in a certain vicinity, in a certain region of the parameter space. So they are looking for these clusters of, of matches. So, and doing all these stages, um, it reduces the number of possible candidates. So it goes from six and 10 to 19, uh, the time here. And after all these stages, it is being reduced to, to just six. And um, this was the um, PhD work of Benjamin Stelter. And it turns out that these six are actually hardware injections. So they wanted to test uh, the system by doing hardware injections. So this is also a common technique. Say, they imprint a particular signal to the mirrors, and they want to find these signals after the data analysis to make sure that all the pipeline is working correctly. And also for continuous waves, there are six hardware injections, and then it was 
uh, able to recover these six hardware injections, which also means there is no other signal, which is the real signal. And uh, that tells us something that, that tells us that um, the gravitational, continuous gravitational waves, the amplitude of the continuous gravitational waves must be smaller, which sets some limits of the eccentricity of the neutron stars in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. So you can do already some astronomy with that. So even a negative result is a result. And by looking longer and calculating harder, um, you can lower these limits. And uh, to some of the, of the models. Uh, in the final part of that talk, or in the final bigger part of the talk, I want to go into for the timing arrays. So what is that? So you have a set of very stable pulsars. I mean, there are a few thousand known pulsars, more than a few thousand known pulsars already. Uh, many of them are not really stable. They are either in binary systems or they have uh, glitches in their frequency, spin down, which means spin down is going on and then suddenly uh, they ramp up very abruptly and then they spin down again. So this is due to real uh, configuration of the neutron star crust. Um, you are heading, you are looking, you're taking a set of very stable uh, pulsars. You're interested in very stable pulsars which have just a few glitches. Um, and if a gravitational passes by, um, the, the pulses of that pulsars are shifted slightly. So they are shifted um, during the emission of the pulse, but you also can see a shift if it happens on Earth, on the detection. Whatever happens in between uh, doesn't matter because it's basically disappearing. So we only, these pulse print or this gravitational wave imprinting into the pulses happens in the beginning or we detect it in the end. It happens on the Earth. So um, this is a sketch of of the time arrival time of the arrival times of the different pulses. So this is the naive uh, arrival time, and it's it's almost constant. You expect pulses coming in a very regular manner, uh, which usually happens. But you have you have uh, small distortions of this arrival times. So there's delta, and you want to learn what this delta actually is of the arrival times. So um, there's a deterministic offset, and then there's some stoch stoch stochastic offset. The, the deterministic offset um, can be due to uh, uh, orbital parameters of, of the Earth and also of the of the pulsar system. So if there's a companion somewhere, um, you have a Doppler shift already created at the emission site. Um, on on the solar system side, you have to very speci precisely determine what the solar system looks like. So where's the virus center? And they can nowadays determine the or pinpoint the virus center uh, down to very few meters. So they can uh, simulate or they can predict uh, the entire orbital motion of all the planets of the solar system very precisely, which helps actually to to find out what this uh, deterministic time difference is. The stochastic part can be noise. It's noise, so usually uh, can be anything. Can be red noise, which happens on the on the pulsar itself. Can be some uh, instrumental noise, but it also can be weather. So if the density of charged particles in the universe changes, if there's a cloud of particles, uh, charged particles passing through the beam, um, we have a different dispersion relation, and uh, which is also unknown right here. So you have to take it to uh, account that one. But it can also be uh, gravitational waves passing by. So, if you compute, if you take, if you kick out everything uh, which is known, and if you ignore for a second the stochastic part, uh, you can say, okay, a gravi potential gravitational wave is causing a particular shift in your arrival times. Um, but since you have many template, uh, many pulsars, uh, you have. Uh, shifts for one uh, pulsar and shifts for the other pulsar caused by the same rotational waves. What you could do is you could uh, compute the scalar product of these shifts. This can be done. And um, if you have several pulsars, um, you expect particular scalar products between the different arrival times or chains of the arrival times. So um, but 
you have several polars and you have tons of angles between them. So you can compute a lot of um, correlations. And it turns out you can, you can do the math. Um, if you just consider a stochastic background, you're not looking for particular single events. You are looking, you are just assume that you have many, many uh, signals coming from everywhere uh, in a stochastic way. So if you take into account all of them, this background, uh, you will have a certain correlation pattern, which is uh, which has been computed by Helens and Downs, and uh, it's exactly that one here. So um, an angle between zero and pi causes that correlations. And there's no other mechanism which could explain such a correlation. So, which means if you look for the correlation of the arrival time changes due to the stochastical background, you will get this curve. Any other mechanism will cause another correlation curve. So, the people are heading nowadays for that one. And for this, we also have to do, to do a lot of statistics. So, uh, background uh, computation, so posterior computation, given some priors to, to learn. How big that effect actually is, and what might be the distortion of that. So um, there's a very good reference um, going into that with the details of the search. Okay, um, so once you have a signal, hmm? yeah, comes then. So once you have a um, signal found by a match, it's not the exact parameters. So each Template is covering a certain space. You don't know where exactly the signal is inside the volume of, of the template. So what you do, what you do is uh, you do a parameter estimation. Then, so you want to maximize the match by changing the parameters such that uh, you find the, the the optimal signal or the the, the highest likelihood given a certain prior. Uh, for that, they use different techniques like uh, nested search. So what they do there is they just place in the in the random fashion different um, templates in the sub volume, and then they look which template is actually giving the best match, and they decrease, they shrink the region about around that particular template, and they in the inside that region they create another set of many templates. So this is called a nested search. If you do it for different ellipsoids, it's a multi nest. And uh, what you also can do, you can uh, run a mod of uh, Monte Carlo chain to, to increasingly find the most optimal likelihood in the parameter space. Um, so there's a metropolis algorithm which helps you also doing jumps inside the parameter space, which is not part of the other techniques. And also, uh, you need to compute the waveforms efficiently and good enough to, to have precise methods in the end. So I want shortly to introduce our, our computation facility. So what we have is we have a high throughput cluster, not a high performance cluster. So we are doing a lot of number crunching. So this match filtering um, and also the search for continuous waves um, is done in a, a very purely parallel way. So each job is running by itself. So it starts the Fourier transform, computes the match, um, and it's not communicating with any other processes, which means we can have just a normal network, Ethernet network. So, and we can just uh, send the jobs to very many cores with the number crunch and get the results back. And that's it. So, which means uh, we can save a lot of money by just optimizing the cluster according to the computational power of the CPUs, not by the network. So, that's why it's not a high, it's not strictly speaking a high performance cluster, it's a high throughput cluster. In our facility, we have 102 water food racks. Each one has uh, 42 height units, so we have slightly above 4,000 height units, basis for X. Uh, we can get rid of one megawatt of feet. Um, our network is basically a big core switch in the center, which has 720 10 gigabit ports, and they are going there, hand out to the different racks uh, with 40 gigabit each. Um, and inside there, we can uh, serve with a slightly over 40, 42. Uh, to the, to the nodes, the network to the nodes. Uh, we have 41 uh, GPU nodes. So these are nodes which have eight uh, RTX 27 GPUs, uh, 27 super GPUs. Uh, it's already not the latest generation, but uh, it's quite decent. And uh, these nodes have been heavily used for the for the continuous wave analysis. Um, we also have uh, from 2015, 545 uh, Huawei Intel nodes, they have uh, two 
processor with uh, 40 uh, physical cores each, so 28 cores or 56 logical cores, 256 gigabyte of RAM. In the latest uh, tender process, we purchased uh, 364 and the Epic nodes. Um, they have 64 cores, which is 128 logical cores and half a terabyte of RAM. Um, and we can do quite a lot of number crunching with that. So we also need uh, data uh, uh, servers. Uh, where we can store all the home directories and the uh, experimental data and, and so on. Um, it's very important actually to have a network which is good enough to send the data to the nodes. So if the nodes are waiting for the data and doing nothing, it's basically a waste of money. So you just want to have a network which is good enough to serve, to send all the data to the nodes, which can do then the number of crunching. So um, yeah, this is the team. Uh, I was with Ellen, Carsten, Alex, and you can see that it's good to have uh, pictures early in your career. Uh, um, we have three of them. And uh, this is an early sketch or early picture of, of our class. You can see we are doing some paperwork here because they are still empty. Um, but this is how it looks like. We have 10 rows of racks. Each row has uh, 8 or 12 racks. And in each rack, we have uh, the spotted five units. What so is the power consumption? So uh, currently we have roughly 750 kilowatt of power consumption, but the facility is um, designed for getting rid of one megawatt of, of heat and also energy of one megawatt. So it's it's expensive. Uh, if you just look through the numbers, so in the end I had like less than one one thousand nodes. So we have space for three thousand additional nodes. They are actually occupied by by nodes which have been already ordered, but we switched them all off to save energy. So they haven't been that efficient anymore. And since energy is so expensive, uh, we just uh, let the most efficient uh, nodes running right now. We hope that the energy crisis will be over soon so that we can fill the gaps again. So we have been asked to reduce our energy consumption by 30%. So that's what we can do for more. That's it. I think I'm in time, right? Yes. So thank you for the talk. So nice to you. Now we have time for questions. So we start with two of you. Do you have English questions? Maybe I will go back to the site localization and the resources. Uh, as far as I know, the first binary neutron star merger uh, was detected in 2017, but one of the detectors was not operating. So the sky localization was not uh, obtained precisely, right? Um, no, there was, uh, I think Drogo was down. So there have been already three detectors in place. Uh -huh. um, I don't know recall. I mean... Um, but I remember this very long banana-shaped yeah. um, uh, contour on the sky, and somewhere there was the source, but not if, precisely known. If you have already the banana in the banana shape, so the, the localization that is already a part of the circle, not the cone basically, which means you have to detect us at least. Yeah, uh, but the third one would be needed one to intercept this with yeah. the, another contour, um, and, and then we would know the, the position. It would be easier or yeah. more precise. Okay. But also, if you have a particular detector not detecting anything, it means it uh, and if it was running, it also limits the, the possible uh, direction of the incoming wave. It was orientated in a way that the detection was not that strong. So it also tells you something. If you can prove that it was operating at that time, that the signal was very weak, tells you also more about the uh, sky localization. And so, but yes, if one is down, you lose a lot of precision in the, in the direction that's good. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so exactly for the purpose of the, of multi messenger astronomy, you also need to be able to alert other astronomers about the detection, which means that you need to be able to uh, figure out the possible detection relatively quickly, not in some kind of long post processing. So we have a special quick pipeline to detect uh, likely yeah. events, something like that. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yes. Um, they do a very rough uh, batch filtering to find candidates, and this has to be done in a very short time. So uh, the signals are coming in, and within a minute, it should be known whether there's a candidate and where it comes from, so that you can uh, locate your, or direct the, the telescope into that direction and hope for 
uh, EM signals that this is being done. So there's a low latency pipeline for, for exactly that one. So um, in the neutron, the neutron star, neutron star merger, um, some of the signals came in hours later or even days later. So we have the dispersion relation of the EM spectrum. So infrared comes uh, clearly later, but we want to avoid missing out also the high frequency part. So that's why you should know actually when it arrives in, in a very short time. So it should be longer than a minute. Yeah, there is this uh, low latency pipeline. Crazy. Okay. There are no other questions. I have to finish. There was just one comment from uh, Jarek Korovic, uh, who's reminding us that really you are on this uh, one of the co author of this famous paper, which was awarded Nobel Prize for the first detection of. Uh, yeah. But the, the Nobel Prize belongs to the people who really deserve that, which is a lot of work actually. So. <laughs> and how? Um, yes. It's good to be a counter of such a paper. Yeah, yeah this is cool. Yeah, yeah. And then you can see what we achieved as a group of people, but still by, by building the cluster. <laughs> well, this is crucial part, one of many crucial parts of this paper. Yeah. So uh, let's thank the speaker again then.